Welcome back to lecture three of numerical methods. We're going to go through today and talk about conditions and loops. So we're going to make that next step into a more advanced programming. So by this point, you should feel comfortable before we begin this class. Um, you should feel comfortable with uh, vectors and matrices performing simple mathematics um, with, with variables, so both um, element by element in a vector or matrices, and then just um, in, in general, and using MATLAB's built-in plotting features to look at, um, to display different data types. We're going to go beyond this sort of simple um, perspective today, looking at um, uh, the beginnings of, of more complex programming structures. So this is going to look at three areas, um, conditional statements based on, on if, um, logical operators, these are going to help both our if statements and, and for and while loops. And then finally, of course, um, for and while loops and how we can implement these. So, so far, our class has talked about um, basic programming where we take a bunch of mathematical operations and we sort of have this um, oops, operation and we have this sort of string of, of mathematical operations, sometimes um, only one and sometimes uh, several operations in a row. And we get to a final answer. There's my horrible handwriting answer, and then we end. But this type of programming very much restricts um, what we can do, right? I have to be, I have to go in and I have to know beforehand what I want to do at every single step of the way, right? I need to know step one, two, three, four, however, all the way down to the end. When you or I do mathematics or, or engineering problem solving by hand, we have a chance to look at the answer as we go through each step to decide on what the next step should be, right? So think back to our example of looking at the um, at, at the water gas shift reaction, and we had to solve the quadratic equation, right? So we had, um, you know, we have negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared um, minus 4ac all over 2a, right? And we had to go in and we had to by hand check whether um, the plus or the minus um, formula for, for our, our quadratic equation um, was, was logical. It would be better, and so this is just one example. And it would be better though, if our program could go in there, we could tell it beforehand, before we actually run the program, um, how to make these choices, right? So we would maybe say, wanna go in, so make an operation, take the output of that operation, maybe into some choice box. So, if I do the plus operation, will I be non-physical? If so, then you know, um, pick the negative, or if not, then pick the positive. Then this choice box could lead to different types of mathematical um, operations that then um, maybe come back together, maybe not, depending on what we're going to do, and then lead to um, some sort of answer. You know, in addition to making these sort of split choices, sometimes we may want to um, go back and redo some sort of operation. Let's say we want to um, look at something um, that's going to happen many times over. Well, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to reprogram the same step 50 times, can we put in um, this, this uh, back arrow that tells the computer to redo something over and over and over again? So these are sort of the two main ways that we can structure our, our program. And we're going to go over um, both of these, first looking at our choice, so if statements, and then going over this, um, uh, going back or, or loops, and that will sort of round out our, our structural programming lessons. Let's look first at um, our decision-making um, element of structural programming. So the first one, and by far the most used one, is an if statement. Right? So this is going to be our general, 
our general um, programming tool. So in essence, what we're going to do is say, if, let me get my pen, okay. So if something happens, so say, I don't know, if X is bigger than zero, right? And we can literally write this in. So if a variable X, so here we have our variable, This is our logic operator. And then this is our condition. So if X is bigger than zero, maybe then B is equal to five. It just sort of coming up with the case, right? So in this case, if, um, X were coming through here, we, we've done some operations on X. We go through if X, our variable, is bigger than we are lab, logic operator zero, it will then set B equals five. Then we need to close um, that structure just to say, to tell MATLAB, okay, we're done with the if statement, continue on with the rest of the program. We just put in this end, right? And so this tells um, MATLAB as it's going through this program, you know, it checks to see if x is bigger than zero. It does this operation um, if x is bigger than zero, and otherwise it ends. Right, so if x is equal to or less than zero, it wouldn't set b equal to five. It would just not set b or, or it would maintain whatever b was um, from earlier on in the program. So let's say we want to set, we want to tell if, uh, we want to essentially write our own absolute value program. We would essentially, we could write, um, use, use this sort of context to say, um, if x is less than zero, x equals negative x, end. In this case, right, whatever is happening, um, if x, because in, in this case, if x was already bigger than zero, we don't need to do anything, we just skip this whole piece. But if x is negative, it's going to enter into this operation that sets x equal to negative x, which um, essentially turns it into a positive number, and then that ends. <clears throat> So we can do more than just say um, if something is uh, satisfies some some condition, um, do something. We can give um, sets of of conditions, right? So we could say, um, let's say if um, you know if a number is bigger than ten, divide by ten. Otherwise, divide by two, right? We could either do this through two different if statements, or we can use else if else statements, which are going to work very similarly, right? So we could say, if x is bigger than 10, a equals x divided by 10. And for that or, we write else, a equals maybe x divided by two, right? And then we can close this by saying end. So let's say, for example, we have x equals five. The computer is going to take x equals five. It's going to go through this if statement. It's going to determine if is x bigger than 10? No. So it's going to skip this a equals 10 slide and go down to this else statement. Okay, x wasn't bigger than 10. So now it's going to um, conduct this next operation, which says a equals x over two. And then it's just going to continue on with the rest of the program, regardless of what happened in here. And we can string these together um, by having multiple ifs or nested ifs um, and um, these, these else statements. We can get uh, very complicated and, and branching programs. So these are going to come in um, again and again throughout the course. <clears throat> So in addition to the ifs, 
we can have another type of structure, which is called a switch. So this is um, useful if we have a variable and we know that that variable is going to be one of uh, a few sets, set cases. So we know that this variable is going to hold information that is going to be dealt with in very specific ways, and it's only going to have very certain values. So the simplest way to think about this is we could think about a stoplight. So we could say um, a variable light, which holds the um, text green. Then we're going to go through our switch statement. So this switch, unlike the if statement, only has the variable that we're going to operate on. And then within that switch indent, we're going to have all the possible cases or in all the cases that we're going to consider. Okay, we just write out, okay, here our first case is when light is equal to green. Okay, when light is green, we can have the computer display the word go. If the um, light held the variable uh, or had held the text red, we could have it display the word stop. Okay. And just like before, we're going to um, tell the computer to stop uh, thinking about the switch or, or the, the structure by using this, this end statement. Just say, okay, um, we're moving out of that switch case. All right? So we can do this with text. We can do something um, with, a, with a variable. Let's say um, we had this variable called var, um, and we knew var was only ever going to be one or two for whatever reason. We could write switch var case one, um, which would set x equals five, and then case two, if var was equal to two, um, it would set x equal to negative five, and then we can end that. Okay, so we can we can um, cause these uh, the code to make decisions uh, make decisions for us. So now let's talk about different sort of relationships that we can. Um, use. So the first type of example is um, we want to see if two variables or, or a variable is equal to a certain number, right? So is something equal? And to do this, we use two equal signs. So it's really critical that we think about this having um, two equal signs, because if we only use one equal sign, we're assigning the variable. So if we said x one if x equals zero, it would just reset x to be zero. We need that second equal sign to tell MATLAB that we're doing a comparison. So I'll just make a note. Um, one equals sign um, sets the variable. Just so you guys have that in your notes. So we'll often find that we, in addition to wanting to see if two things are the same, we may want to see, we want to do something if they're not equal or they're, they're different. So we can use the tilde, um, that little squiggle that's um, to the left of the one button on the computer to say not. So um, maybe x is not five. For some reason, five is, is bad, right? If x is not five, um, we do a bunch of operations. And, and if x is five, then um, we do something else. Okay? So then we have sort of traditional things, less than, greater than, less than or equal, greater than or equal, just to sort of give you a flavor of these operations. Sometimes we want to look at um, multiple conditions. We may want to say that um, we want to maybe do an operation that occurs when x and y are non-zero, or where x or y is, is non-zero. Right? Um, so we can use the ampersand for and, or these double vertical lines. Um, which are just uh, to the right 
of the um, bracket sign on your keyboard to stand for or. Right? And in this way, we can string multiple of these um, logic operators together in, um, to make more and more complex um, different cases that we may want to look at. So let's take an example and let's write this out. So we want to write an if statement that's going to, we want to look at what, um, we want to say that z equals x plus y if and only if x is less than 5 and y is greater than 7. So let's write out two logical conditions that will um, evaluate that z equals y plus x. So we can do this, we can look at the word, so um, x less than 5, so we can put that in there, x less than 5, and y greater than 7. So essentially just taking these words and putting them into um, sort of mathematical terms, right? So if x is less than 5 and y is greater than 7, z will be equal to x plus y. Otherwise, if um, otherwise, z will be equal to 2. So let's ask a few questions. What's going to happen if x is 3 and y is 8? So first, if x is 3, we're going to go through here and check. The computer is going to go in and check. So when x equals 3, is x less than 5? Yes. Great. Then it's going to look on the other side of this ampersand and it's going to say, is y greater than 7? Well, it's 8. So that means that yes, it is, y is bigger than 7. And then it's going to look to see, are both of these conditions true? And it, it was yes, right? This was yes, this was yes, they're both yes. So then um, z is going to be equal to 11. So let me write that in. In that case, z equals 11. So what happens if x is still 3, but y is now 7? So MATLAB is going to go through and do the exact same set of operations that we just talked about. So it's first going to look and see x, which is 3, is, is 3 less than 5? Yes. Is 7 greater than 7? No. 7 is equal to 7, not greater than 7. So we have one yes and one no. This and operator means both have to be true, but this on the right hand side is not true. So this whole if statement is now going to be false. So it's going to say, ah, this we're no longer holding true to the statement. So I'm going to go down to this else case and z is going to then be equal to 2. So we can put z equals 2. So let's look at a slightly different case where we say we want, um, once again, z equals x plus y, but this case, if x is less than 5 or y is greater than 7. So let's write this in. So we have x if x is less than 5, now we need our or, so double vertical lines, y greater than 7. Then we can fill in the rest of, of, the, of the information. We'll say that z is equal to x plus y, otherwise, or, or else, z equals 2. And then we say we're done. So what's going to happen if, in the same set of cases, so what happens if x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 8? So first we'll go through. Um, we'll, we can think what the computer is going to do. It's first going to say, okay, here I have a 3 in for this. Um, put this, maybe I'll write in blue. Um, we have 3 in for x. Is 3 less than 5? Yes. Now it'll go over here and check. Is 8 greater than 7? Also yes. If either one of those is true because of or, 
the statement is true. So then it will tell us that z equals 11. So what's going to happen now if um, x equals 3 and y equals 7? Let me pick a different color this time. So if, if x equals 3 and y now equals 7, I have that 3 is less than 5, so that's true. But once again, I have 7 is not bigger than 7, so I can maybe put like a little check mark. So one's true, one's false. But because it's an or, if one or the other is true, z equals x plus y. Okay, so one of them is true. So in this case, z is still equal to 11. So let's put this into practice. So let's go back to uh, the case that we've been talking about for a while now, the water gas shift. In practice, the water gas shift reaction has to be catalyzed. It doesn't happen spontaneously in the gas phase. Additionally, when the temperature of the reaction is less than 600 K, the conversion falls off very rapidly as the catalyst becomes inactive. We can model that catalyst becoming inactive using this equation. Um, the, the true conversion is the uh, thermodynamic conversion times this expression that takes into account catalytic deactivation. Okay, so in essence, we need to split our um, code up into two pieces. So before, right, we had um, input, um, which brought in maybe the temperature, we calculated K, we calculated A, B, and C, and then we use the quadratic formula to calculate x, or, or in this case, x naught. But now we need something that's going to take x naught and determine and branch it into two pieces. One, where the temperature is less than 600, and one that's greater than or equal to 600. In the case of less than 600, we need to put in um, calc, calculate x from x0. And in the case that we're greater than 600, we just set x is equal to x0. And then end. All right. So let's go in and um, put this a little bit into that scaffold form that we just just looked at. So right, so um, in building this code, we need inputs. For right now, let's just take in t and output um, x. Then two will calculate k. Three. I'm going to just shorthand this as to calc. Calc to calculate x naught. Four, we need some sort of if statement for um, x less than 600. And then five, return x. All right, so this is sort of our scaffold. Um, so we can now take this idea, this, this written out set of instructions, and put them into mathematical terms um, in MATLAB. So I'll see you over in MATLAB. So now that we're back in MATLAB, we can come in and uh, take sort of our old conversion code and modify it to, um, uh, to, to do, take in this if if statement. So first I'm going to modify this by naming it a different, um, uh, something different so that we don't accidentally overwrite our working code. So here I've just called this 
cat underscore conversion, um, which is going to take in T. And then we go through our normal um, calculation of K, A, B, C, and then calculate um, our different X's. So this is that first bit of the scaffold. So I'm going to now just put in um, uh, the, the new piece that we need. So we now need um, a piece that's going to uh, uh, determine if T is bigger than six, is less than 600. And if so, um, uh, implement that catalytic conversion equation. Implement conversion. Everything else is essentially the same. So I'm going to go through here because if you remember back, X was what we were returning. So I'm going to change this X here to be X is zero, right? Because we want to have that variable to play with. So now, in order to implement this check, we need to write our if statement. So if, and then the very first thing that I recommend doing after you type in if is hit enter to type in end, just so you don't forget to put that in there. Okay, so now we need to know if temperature is less than 600, right? So I have my, my variable that I'm gonna check, T, the operator less than, um, and 600. Now I'm going to implement my equation x equals um, x equals x naught times exp negative uh, 50,000 divided by 8.314 times t plus 10. All right, so just copying and pasting or, or just typing out that that equation and that will give us our conversion. It will we'll just make it quiet um, by, by putting in that semicolon. So we can either leave this here, but right now, in case the temperature is bigger than 600, we have no X. So we probably wanna put in an else statement that says if um, it's not less than, we want X to be X naught, right? Just to just to round that out. Okay, so this is this is as easy um, uh, easy peasy piece of cake. So let's let's check and see how this goes. So let's take t equals um, seven hundred, and we'll throw it in here. So cat. Uh, cat conversion t all right we have um uh, a number and now we can put in something that's less than 600 so say t equals um, 550 uh, we can go in um, put that into cat conversion again and now we have this number that's um now we get an answer. If you remember back from a previous, our previous code, um, when we previously put in 500, uh, before we took into account the catalysis or that if statement, and we got this, this number that was um, much bigger than the current number that we get when we take into account that conversion, which means that our if statement was working. So we, we have our conversion, um, we, can, we can check, we know that our, our if statement is working. So let's see what happens when we try to put in our, um, just like we did before, we can go say from 300 in increments of 50 up to 700. This should mean that we have um, some portion of the code going through this, um, uh, executing this first piece of the if statement, and then the other uh, two or three points going um, through this else statement. So let's see what's going to happen when I click, um, oh, uh, when I input this new temperature into um, the cat conversion code. So when I do this, scroll up, 
what we see is that my 300 degrees C, uh, 350, 400, all the way up, doesn't look like it's going through that first if statement. Why is that? That's because MATLAB doesn't know how to deal with um, this if statement because if uh, t is, is an array. So it's going to look for any case where one of my values satisfies um, or it's just going to sort of skip that because right there's it doesn't know how to evaluate um, a whole array being compared to 600. So when we put a series of these um, values, so this range of temperatures through this if statement, that if statement is going to default to the else. So we need something new that's going to help us walk through all of our different t's in order to um, walk through all the different t's uh, if we want to look at multiple t's at the same time. And so this is where loops are going to come in handy. So what we really want to do is we want to loop over every single t and evaluate that if statement. So, uh, and this is just one case of where loops might come in handy. So when we're looking at loops, we can think of two different types of loops, for loops and while loops. And let's, let's take a second to talk about these two types of loops and then we'll go back to MATLAB and, and see how we can adjust the code to take, into, um, to take these loops into account. So the first type of loop is a for loop. And so this is going to be when we're, we know how many times we want to do a specific task, right? So we've put in there, um, we, we have some sort of uh, data set and we want to do something, you know, say 10 times. And we know from the beginning that uh, that, that number is set. So in this, in the case, sort of in the water gas shift case, right? We know that we want to do that check um, to see if we're less than 600 degrees a certain number of times. That number of times is, is um, the, the number of elements in the array, right? But, but it's, it's preset at the beginning of, of the code. We, we know it's how many times we need to do that. The other type of variable that we need to consider are while loops. It's sort of like a for loop, but this is for cases where we want to do an operation until something happens. Or in another way, when we don't know how many times we want to do a certain operation. So let's go and look at each of these types of loops, then we can decide um, what we want to do in our water gas shift code. <clears throat> so here's, our for, here's an example of our for loop. So in our for loop, in our for loop, it's going to contain a um, similar set of uh, a similar set up to if statements. So we're going to call first on four, but we're going to set a new variable. So this i is going to be a counter. And it's going to count. And it's going to count from a, so we'll call this begin. So it's gonna begin with i equals a, and then every time it goes through the loop, it's going to increment by b, and it's going to um, end, end when i is greater than n. Okay, so all of this information is set up in a single line. So we, we set up a new variable that's going to act as a counter. We tell it where to start counting. We tell it how much to increment the count by, and then we tell it when to end. After we give it all this, all this for loop information, we then say what types of operations we want to conduct. Okay, what are the mathematical things that we want to look at? And then of course we have our end statement to tell MATLAB, stop. So when MATLAB gets to end, it's gonna go back up to the for loop, 
um, do that increment, go through the operations, and it'll keep looping here. Let's look, in the, let's look at an example. So the easiest or most straightforward example could be uh, the case of a factorial, right? So if you don't remember, um, you know, uh, three factorial is equal to three times two times one. Oops. Three times two times one. <clears throat> so, right, so a factorial, we take the number and then multiply um, by uh, one less of everything. Right, so if we were going to write this, we need a for loop because we know um, how many times we want to do something, right? So in the case of three, I want to multiply, um, I want to multiply three times two times one. So I wanna do, um, I wanna run this loop of multiplication n times, right? Whatever, whatever this sort of three is. Okay, so we can start off with saying x equals one, and then comes our for loop. So we start our counter. So in this case, i, and, and usually for um, for loops, we, we try to pick i just just so that we know that it's a for loop or or a while loop. Um, we set i equals to one, right? And so then we're going to say x equals x times i. Then it's going to hit this end. It's going to come back around. It's going to then increment by one, right? If I don't have a B, um, it just assumes B is one. So then it'll go to two. So then it'll say X equals X times two. Then it'll come down to the end, loop around. Um, in this case, um, it'll increment by one. So then I will be um, three. Uh, so then X equals um, x times 3, end. Right, so we're going to loop through here um, again and again and again. So, right, so on the first loop through, so first time through, x equals 1. The second time, oops, maybe let me write this out this way. First time, i equals 1, therefore x equals 1. The second time, i is equal to two, x times x, which is, is one, times i, which is two, is two. Then we go through for the third loop, we get to the end, we go back, i equals three this time. So then we come in, x equals x, which is now two, times i, which is now three, so x equals six, which is three factorial. And we could do this again, we could go to four, um, i is four, then this becomes uh, 24, and so on and so forth, All right? So these are four loops, we know how many times I want to do something. So let's do this modification um, to our code. So here, instead of saying, I wanna multiply every time through, um, I want to take every variable in T and run the sets of operations. So we need to scope, we need to code all the way back from the beginning. So we need one, our input and output. So this would be um, t in going to x out. Now, because t is going to be a, um, <clears throat> t is going to be uh, uh, changing, um, or we're going to add that, that modification at the end, we get to keep our k so we can keep those outside of the loop, right, because the um, pre-exponential um, isn't going to isn't going to change. Or sorry, the, the equilibrium constant isn't going to change, so we can just keep calc k. I'm going to wrap these all together again. So calc x zero, 
But now I need my for loop. So we need a for loop. So we want to loop over um, the index of t. So we hit every single one. And then within here, I'll maybe call this a, check if t is less than 600. And if it is, put a Roman numeral, then um, calc the uh, catalyst piece. Right? So essentially we get to keep a lot of our old code. So we get to keep a lot of this code, but we need to add in this new um, looping over our index pieces. So let's go over to MATLAB. We can bring in this um, new idea of the loop and implement it. Okay, so let's um, add this piece in. So if you remember um, from our scaffold, we need the loop to be before, uh, we need to loop over the T's, the temperatures before we get into, um, uh, into this if statement. So we need to put this on the outside. So loop over indices. So, right, so we know it's a loop, we have a four, and now we wanna put in our end, and we want that end to be after, um, after that if statement. So we can put in this end, and MATLAB will handily, um, if you click on end, it'll highlight the four, and if you click on the four, it'll highlight that end, just so you can see what's, what's going on. So now we wanna look at every single index in T. So we can say, i equals one, because MATLAB starts with one, colon, um, we're gonna increment by one, to however long t is. If you remember back to uh, the first discussion, or I guess um, the discussion from Tuesday, we can use the length command um, on t, and that will allow us to count from one how, to however long um, t is, right? Okay, so now this is gonna loop us over our indices. Now here's the problem. Um, it still doesn't know which t to look at. So I'm gonna include in t the index i, right? So I'm gonna look at the ith index to check um, in this expression. What we need to do, of course, now is uh, put in the indices for everywhere that we have a variable that's going to change. So we have some ith instance of x0, we have an ith index of t, we have an ith index of x. I think that's all of it. Uh, and then we have the else statements i not. Um, X not, there we go. So now we have all of these, these indices, right? So I is going to change by one. It's going to look, um, it's going to take in an individual T and evaluate this if statement. You can already start seeing why it's re, um, helpful to put in these in, uh, indents. So I'm gonna input an indent here. So now it's very easy to see that this for loop matches with this n and everything else is going to happen inside. Right? So we can see um, what's, what's sort of held within each, each subcommand. Now let's try that cat conversion code with, with our, our set of t's again. So when we do this, we see that now instead of um, monotonically increasing as temperature decreases, so or, um, we have this sort of uh, zero, which increases, 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 and then starts decreasing. So just to um, see this on a plot, we could plot T against the answer. 
and we should see um, this figure pop up where we can see uh, now we have this increase in activity and then decrease in activity. Okay, so hopefully you can now sort of see how we can use for loops where for loops are gonna come in. Um, very handy uh, for um, moving through indices and uh, things like factorials. So let's go back um, and talk about while loops. So while loops are for cases where operations are gonna be done over and over again, but we don't really know how many times we wanna do it. In the water gas shift example, we knew that we wanted to do it, uh, we knew that we wanted to do the operation um, for however long t was. But there could be a case where we don't really know um, uh, what, what we're looking for. So a while loop is going to do a task again and again until some sort of condition is reached. So in this case, we're going to um, have some sort of variable and we're not going to set that variable, right? So in a for loop, we said, I equals some number to some other number. Here we just say while a variable or as long as a variable i meets some sort of logical condition in relationship to some comparison, then we want to do an operation. So let's look at an example. So let's say we want to um, count how many times it takes uh, um, how many times it takes to go from n to zero in increments of dn right? so here we don't know how many times you know um, how many times a dn goes into n we want to we want to figure that out oops sorry so we, we don't know that a priori or, or beforehand. So we're going to need to use a while loop rather than a for loop. So in this case, I can set a variable steps um, that's going to set to count how many times it takes me to decrease to zero. And then I have my while loop. So n is coming in from the beginning. As long as n is bigger than zero, I'm going to do these sets of operations. So let's set up this sort of table. So we'll call it um, step one, um, two, three, four. We don't know quite how many of these steps are going to be needed. And we'll um, say n. And we can have um, steps. And let's just say that we're going to call this with n equals five and dn equals two. Okay, so what's gonna happen as I go through this series? When I first start steps is zero, I'm gonna come to my while piece. It's going to say, um, what is n? Well, in this case, n is five. Is five bigger than zero? Yes. So my new n is going to be n equal to n minus dn. So 5 minus 2 is 3. And steps is equal to steps plus 1. Well, steps was 0, but now it's 1. It hits the end, and then it goes um, back up to this to the while piece, right? It just kicks it back to this while. So now it goes in and it says, is n bigger than zero? Well, in this case, n is three. Three is bigger than zero. So it's going to say n is equal to three minus two. Oh, that's one. Steps equals steps plus one. That's two. 
it comes to the end. We go back up to the top. N is now equal to 1. Okay, is 1 bigger than 0? Yes, N equals N minus N1. Oh, let me pick maybe a different um, color for this next round, maybe orange. <clears throat> so I now take um, N minus 1. Um, that's negative 1. I don't stop then because I haven't hit end yet. So I do steps equals steps plus 1. I get to negative, I get to 3. Right, because 2 plus 1 is 3. I now hit the end. I go back up to while. Now I have n is negative 1. Is negative 1 bigger than 0? No. So I get to go through and I leave that while loop. But since I left that while loop before I got to increment, uh, before I did any of those other um, operations, steps is still equal to 3. And that would be what would um, show up if I accessed steps um, outside of the loop or when I get to the end, that 3 is what's reported um, as that final value. <clears throat> okay, so now that we've covered the basics of loops, um, I want to talk about nesting. So nesting is what happens when we want to loop over multiple variables. So I can do this with for loops or while loops, combinations of for loops and while loops, and in conjunction with if loops. And these three things um, are what makes coding so powerful. So nested set of, of loops is when I um, loop over one variable. Let's say I have this um, uh, matrix A. I have, I have one loop, one for loop indexed with I that's going to loop over um, rows one through three. And then I'm going to loop over J, which is going to loop over the columns. Now I know that it's going, that I is going to, interact with, with the rows because i is first, and j is then going to index um, over the columns because j is coming up second. So let's very quickly um, talk through how this is going to um, start. So step one is going to set i equal to one. Then when I go down to step two, j equals one. So when I come down to step three, a i j is going to be equivalent to a one one, which equals one. If I go back and look um, at that top column, so um, then it goes through to this: if a i j is equal to nine, it's one. So we don't. We come down to this end. When I'm done with this. Um, uh, and it's going to go into the next step to this to this end. This is going to come all the way up here to this J. So let me switch colors really quickly. We'll go to purple. So then the next step three is going to set J equal to two. I is still one. So when I come down to the next step and I say A I comma J, what I'm talking about is a one comma two. In this case, it's equal to two, right? And so I can go through this to step four, um, where j is equal to three. I get a i comma j equal to a one comma three. So then this equals three. So once j is 3, I come through to this for loop. I, I complete that for loop, and I hit this end. And now I'm ready to move on to this next step, so this next end. When this has now been hit, I come back all the way up here. So I'm ready for number 5. In this case, i is going to increment by 1. So all of a sudden, i is now equal to 2. So I go down to this next step, 
back to my j. Now I'm starting j all anew. So j equals 1. When I go on to the, to the next line, I end up with a i comma j equal to a 2 comma 1, which should be 4. And this will increment um, over the over the j's rapidly and over the i's slowly. So by doing these nests, um, I can access all um, nine pieces of information um, in that A matrix and, and um, do whatever manipulation I want to on that A matrix. Great. So the last thing within loops that I want to talk about is breaking loops. So sometimes we want to stop a loop. Um, this is going to come in really handy when we start looking at iterative solutions to problems. Essentially, we've hit some sort of benchmark and we're ready to stop whether or not um, the loop says it's time to be done. So we can do this with the break command. So if we just type break into, into a system, uh, into a loop, it's going to stop that loop. So in this case, I have s equals zero. I'm going to count over um, increment i. I'm going to I'm going to loop over i from one to ten. I'm going to take say s equals s plus one, and then once I hit greater than five, I have this this break command. So s will count zero, one, um, three. Uh, one, three, six, and as soon as it hits six, this break is going to come in and it's going to jump all the way out of the for loop, right? So it's not going to continue anything after that. It's just done and it's over, okay? So usually these break commands are um, nested inside an if statement. So if something happens, stop. Okay, so some last uh, few notes on loops. Um, really some, some things to watch out for. So for loops um, are relatively easy to set up, but you have to know um, how many times you want to loop before we begin. The other issue is most for loops are gonna break if we don't know, um, if we have index issues. So uh, for example, um, if I have some uh, t, some variable t um, with a length 5, and I have some sort of for loop, say 1 to 10, and I call t of, of i, I'm going to have my for loop break because it's going to try to access information at indexes 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, which, which don't exist. So this is where most for loops are going to tend to break. While loops, you can do all sorts of interesting creative things um, setting different conditions. While loops are tricky because they need to be pre-initialized. So before you enter that loop, you have to have a variable dedicated or, or generated already that's going to then um, be used for the comparison. The biggest places where while loops tend to fail are um, people forgetting to increment um, or uh, lack of initialization. So for example, um, people might do while n is um, less, less than 10, less than 10, and they then set n equals um, a plus three, I don't know. In this case, n is firstly initialized within the while loop, which will break because this first call is referencing n, but it hasn't been defined yet. So n has to be, or, or whatever um, comparison you're gonna make has to be done outside the loop 
um, first. Okay, and so then the other issue um, is uh, sometimes um, people will say, you know, t, so time is zero while time is less than 10, you know, um, x equals x o plus v times t, x o equals x, and in this case, um, this loop will break because there's nothing that advances t. So t will always be zero and never moving forward. Um, you have to make sure that you have t equals t plus, I don't know, one or, or some sort of other increment. Um, so if you ever end up with this infinite loop, pressing control C, so let me put this in here. Um, uh, control plus C will we'll stop MATLAB, put on the hard brakes to get you out of um, this infinite loop um, and so that you can fix that. Okay, so at this point, hopefully you feel comfortable or at least are starting to get an idea of how we can write conditional statements using if and switch. Um, you've seen uh, logic operators um, greater than, equal to, less than, not equal to, um, and uh, you're starting to get exposed to for loops and while loops, and, and you know or should know um, some of the benefits and, and drawbacks of each. I look forward to seeing you in class and, and hopefully you've learned a lot.